Uh, this is talk three. And I did get into, in the beginning here, uh, last, time, last time we were here two weeks ago, uh, you know, uh, the Fe January 21, uh, 1793, uh, Louis the Sixteenth is going to get his hair cut on that machine, the guillotine. However, I want to get back in a little bit how we got there in the first place, uh, because this is the terror. And also at the same time, I'm going to get into today, levee en masse. The French are the ones that really start this. Lazar Carnot, organizing entire populations and entire economies for war. Because as I mentioned, and this, and this is really extremely important here, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to reiterate this. Uh, you see here, you know, with the American and French revolutions, these are, these are, these are, uh, uh, these are actions putting the ideas of the front of the age of reason and enlightenment into action. Really what you're seeing here. Uh, you know, again, liberalism, democracy, republicanism, secularism, socialism, nationalism, parliamentarianism, you know, the old idea here, or the prevalent idea, conventional wisdom, conventional politics here of monarchy, royalty, aristocracy, nobility is dying here. And it's being undermined, suborned, eviscerated, it's going to be killed in the end, with with the uh, the uh, the age uh, the age of reason age of enlightenment, but the industrial revolution, uh, the rise of the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, working class, you know, working class, urban poor is coming because with this, people are going to be gravitating from the countryside to the cities or large towns. That's what's going to help kill the Confederacy. You know, what you're seeing here in the French Revolution is a mirror of what's going to happen to the South. <laughs> uh, by that I mean the Industrial Revolution, urbanization. Uh, this, the, South, the South was agrarian. You know, the, the, landed, the Southern aristocracy or landed gentry, Southern boyers, whatever you want to call them, you know, they had those political fiefdoms. They were also known as plantations which really was a concentration camp system. The agrarian capitalism was built on that in the South. And yet, as this war goes on, this notion of Southerners being the real defenders of states' rights, defenders of the Constitution, by, by the middle of 1862, that's a lot of bunk because they're going to build a strong central government. They have to industrialize because you can't expect a nation of farmers to beat a nation of wrench turners in this era. It's not going to work. But here you see in the French Revolution the shades of what are coming along. And I'm going to get into that a little bit. But again here by 1792, 1793, interesting here is the bourgeoisie that leads this revolution. The bourgeoisie. You know, the rising capitalist class here, which Marx is going to talk about in the Communist Manifesto. And also here, the last week, I'm going to get into just a little bit here, a teaser, if you will, about the rise of communism coming out of this revolution. You got that coming. You got that coming. In fact, I was reading not all that long ago, one of the prefaces to one of the, the editions of the Communist Manifesto, I mentioned before, socialism. Socialism. Uh, Frederick Engels, I think, I'm not sure, I think it was the, it might have been the Polish edition or Norwegian edition of the manifesto. He will later write that it was becoming fashionable, even at this stage, latter part of the 19th century, that, you know, with people like Louis Blanc, Saint Simon, these utopian socialists, that socialism was becoming acceptable to the bourgeoisie. Leaving, get this surmise, leaving that if socialism is becoming acceptable to the bourgeoisie, leading to corporate socialism is where he's going with this, that communism was for the working class. Get a load of that one. Wow. Yeah, because it was geared to what? The proletariat. You see the beginnings of, of, of the proletariat here. Well, not the beginnings, the carry forward of it here in France. You're already having a proletariat in England. They had their revolution in the 17th century. Again, the snowballing of the Industrial Revolution, the building of a new class here. 
and it's going to change what's coming down the pike. But so will war. And interesting here, and so when you see what's going on here in the national, national convention prior to the constituent assembly or legislative assembly, prior to that was, was, was the national assembly, you know, as this third estate, the third estate really becomes the government here. You know, when you had your three estates, the clergy, the nobility, and the mass is the third estate. You've heard that brought up every periodically in our, in our literature here when they talk about government here today, the third estate. Well, who's supposed to be the fourth estate? The press. That's who was called the fourth estate. Of course, you didn't have the, they didn't consider a fourth estate here. It was just to arrange your government. And again, going back a little bit here, you know, before when you had, when you had the, 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 the estates general, like back in 1614, the first estate and the second estate, they each estate voted as one block. So obviously here, things like the clergy and the nobility are going to vote together to, to outdo the third estate. Two to one. You know? Two to one. And so the mass are always kept down. Here, the mass is going to assert itself. And even here, uh, Jacques Necker, who was one of those who will be uh, considered the Chancellor of the Exchequer, whatever you want to call him, the accountant for the, 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 accountant for the, for the crown, who's liberal, by the way, he's Swiss, he wasn't French, he was Swiss, later said that the, nobil that the third estate should have, with, with individuals involved in the third estate, equal to what is going to be uh, accounted for by the first two estates. So in other words, there will be 300 representatives or delegates from the first estate, 291 from the nobility, 610 for the third estate. But the third estate will assert its mass, and eventually they're even going to be able to get, they're even going to be able to get part of the clergy on their side forming the National Assembly. And the reason that is, is because the privileged clergy are the ones who exert, exert power for the church. Not the average parish priest. He's lucky if he's got enough money to throw out a window. He doesn't have to even have that window. They're poor. They're poor. And so some of them will go to the third estate. And that's the, really the beginning of the weakness here of Louis the Sixteenth. And they are going to assert their primacy. They are the ones that are going to consider themselves the National Assembly. In other words, the new French government. But there's a problem here. You know, the bourgeoisie, middle class, whatever you want to call them, are the ones that are going to lead this revolution. Sure, at some point here, you're going to see, you're going to see the middle class, or bourgeoisie, throw themselves with, the, with nobility. Because they are asserting their control of land. They are getting into buying land. Now, the interesting thing here is they are jealous of the nobility to a certain extent where they consider the nobility at this stage, 17, 1789, 1790, 1791, as a class of unearned wealth. Many of them have had a hand it on down to them. Not so the bourgeoisie, who are earning their wealth. Here we go with that. Haven't you heard about unearned wealth here with some of America's privileged class? Isn't that what some people say about them? There are people that earn their wealth. Let's understand that. But don't you have at this stage of the game people who have had that wealth handed on down to them? Of course you do. Isn't that going to be in any country? Of course it is. But the bourgeoisie is now taking, and they're interesting because they are now beginning to control the money. Bankers? These bankers aren't nobility. They're part of that class, the bourgeoisie. They are beginning to assert their authority, but at the same time, they too are buying up land. And land is a determiner of power. If anybody knows that, the peasants do, even though many of them are uneducated.
They understand that. They understand that. And so as senior rights, rights of feudalism are being refuted, overturned, and becoming illegal. Keep in mind the nobility going into this. Nobility was 3% of the population, yet they own 20% of the land. And they're not paying the taxes. They're supposed to, but they're not. The Thai tax, for instance, everyone's supposed to pay that. They're not paying that. The Vientiane came out in 1749, was another tax to raise money for the government, for the crown, because they're, they're, you know, France is becoming an economic basket case. Well, the nobility has to pay to, straighten, to help straighten out or stabilize. Oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. Boy, that sounds familiar. And so the peasants are left to pay. Well, if there's rising prices on food and grain, how are they going to pay? How are they going to pay? They're not going to be able to pay. They're not. And so France becomes an economic basket case. Economics is every bit as much a determinant for this revolution than anything else. How about a better piece of the pie? No, the nobility and clergy want to control that. And this is also going to lead to, this is also going to lead to that anti-Catholic church angst that's going to be part of this revolution too. Although many will not abandon religion, even there, even though Robespierre at one point was one of those with the uh, involved with that dechristianization effort. There is a creator. He's interesting. He was a deist from the perspective that some like some of your founders were. Only here, your founders were smart because they didn't de try to dechristianize the country. What do you see and what do you see in your constitution? Bill of Rights? Freedom of religion? They were taking this a step further in France. And there will be a backlash. That's going to be one of the things that leads to, no, to Robespierre's downfall. Interesting. Interesting. And so there were some, even with the bourgeoisie, sure, we'll get rid of senior rights because feudalism at this point really doesn't exist. But some of the holdover decrees, taxes, fees that are going to be that are going to be applied to the to the uh, to the peasantry. That exists. That exists. And so while feudalism is really abolished here, what difference does it make? Because when the peasants go to take control of the land, they're going to have to pay title fees. They're going to have to pay fees to the, to the, to the nobility because now they're being, their rights are being transferred to the land. And then some of them are going to have to pay to buy the land. They're still stuck. They're still stuck. Same thing's going to happen in Russia when they abolished serfdom in 1861, Alexander II. What happened to the peasants? Gee, they can own land. But at what cost? You know, the, the, the czar cannot lose the support of the boyars. And they and the boyars know this. Sure, the peasants can have the land. Some of these peasants are going to be stuck paying a 50-year mortgage. 50-year mortgage. How many generations is that before they pay it off? And keep in mind, these people aren't going to control the prices of what they're growing here and selling. So guess what? That mortgage is going to be more than 50 years. They're going to be stuck in indentured servitude. Hence the upheaval in 1905, followed by the upheaval in 1917. Land. Here we go. And so here, the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie, yes, are also into buying land. But the peasant doesn't care who, who, who the, really owns this land because they're still stuck paying fees, taxes, duties, so on and so forth. And so somebody like a Robespierre who leads the Jacobins, now that's interesting because the bourgeoisie is not just one class, is not just one entity. The, 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 the Girondins, led by Jean-Pierre uh, Brousseau. Jean-Pierre Brousseau believed in a government run by the privileged set. 
by the privilege set. A constitutional monarchy, maybe? He didn't want to get rid of uh, Louis XVI. But at the same time, at the same time, it would be a combination of nobility and upper bourgeoisie who would run the government. You know, and we're going to have active and passive voters. Get a load of this one. Active and passive voters. Who are active voters? People who own land. Wasn't that done here? In the beginning of the country? If you own property, you can vote, right? Passive voters actually are people who they consider to not to be educated enough to vote. They could be manipulated by the aristocracy. Who's manipulating who here? It's almost to the extent that would, as the bourgeoisie is, sub, is, is suborning the aristocracy, let's understand where this is going here. It's like these, the mass is going to exchange one overseer for another. That's what always got me about the Japanese. You know, at the beginning of the 20th, at the end of the 19th, into the 20th century, you know, as they're rising as a power here, Asia's power here, let's kick out Asia for Asians. Let's kick out the, the white Christian colonial powers. This will be the basis of that greater East Asia co prosperity sphere. I like the names they give some of these programs here. That's longer than, than the width of the chair you're sitting on. But what is it for? Organize Asia for Asians, but you know, the Japanese, yeah, as long as we run it. So people here are just trading one overseer for another. But, but the, the Girondins also believed, by the way, of retaining the monarchy, constitutional monarchy, with the privileged set running the country. But at the same time here, they thought, they thought that we ought to declare war against all the surrounding monarchs. Let's carry the ideas of the French Revolution cross borders and take out the monarchs, the Habsburgs, the Prussian monarch, the Tsar, uh, the King of England, which right now at this point is a really a constitutional monarchy. The Spanish monarchy, let's take that out. Get rid of those principalities on the Italian boot. And yet, somebody like, um, somebody like uh, Robespierre, uh, who's a Jacobin, the Jacobins are bourgeoisie, but they are the lesser bourgeoisie, maybe store owners, maybe getting into owning property, marketers, traders. They're not in the upper bourgeois class. They are against also, by the way, corporations, big business. Many, some of these are small business owners. Marx would later call them petty bourgeoisie. You know, when you go to the Russian Revolution, Lenin, yeah, is going to nationalize the banks. Lenin's going to nationalize big companies. Well, the, some of the big companies that really existed in Russia at that point. But, to a certain extent, they left the small businessman alone. He's not considered a threat. Not considered a threat. This is the, this is the group, the Jacobins, who are going to ally themselves with the peasants. And you know, uh, Robespierre will be against this active passer voter stuff. No, everybody's got to vote. Well, who do you think he's appealing to? The mass. If this revolution is to better France, everybody needs to be included. And so who do you think some of the peasants are going to go with here? Robespierre? Yeah. And they're radical. Interestingly enough, this is a bourgeois revolution, but it gets its revolutionary impetus from the bottom. The sans culottes. These are these are this this is this emerging working class from the cities. Urbanization, the working class, and the urban poor. So now you have an effort to get the working class in the cities and the urban poor together with who? The peasants. And keep in mind, there were periods here between 
1789 and getting into 1793, 1794, where some of these peasants weren't waiting for central government. They were, they were just taking the land. They were, you know, in some of these villages and small towns, they're, they're invading the city, the, the government houses, and, and taking the deeds and the titles to the land and burning them. Well, now, how can, the, how can some of these nobility prove they own the land? <laughs> and then grab the land, that pitchfork the land of gentry, and then take the land and divide it up. You know where else you saw this? Russia. Even Lenin, you know, hands off here. How are you going to stop 90% of the population from doing this? You think you're going to stop them? You have to wait till this tide recedes. That's what happens when you have centuries of pent-up frustration. Now it's the masses chance to even the score. Even the score, eliminate the scoreboard. Grab control of the land. Thank God our revolution did not degenerate into this. God knows what the United States would have become. And I am thoroughly convinced one reason, a major reason, we did not degenerate into this violence. Well, let's make no mistake, American Revolution was violent, I'll give you that. But this unrestrained violence was because we never went through that era of serfdom here. Why? The white man wasn't even here. Who was here? The red man. Serfdom? What the heck is that? We missed that, and I'm thoroughly convinced, since we missed that, that we were saved this mindless violence, which you will see in Europe, in France, and again in Russia. But at the same time here, at the same time, you see something else. You know, these monarchs outside Europe have to kill this revolution. They've got to kill these ideas in the womb. And by 1792, they're at war. Austria, Prussia, invade. Things ain't looking too good here for the French Revolution. Now they're being invaded from the outside. There's threats to the revolution inside the country, threats to the revolution outside. You know, Leopold II of Austria his sister is married to Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette. There was a fear among some of the revolutionaries that she'd call her brother, to have a contact her brother, he'd send in troops to put this down. And so the, the, the uh, invading armies will eventually be stopped at a place called Valmy on September 20, 1792. And you know, whenever you see these books, Decisive Battles in History, that battle is hardly ever mentioned. Hardly ever mentioned. And there is a historical parallel here. You know, they're invaded by outsiders, and they finally stop them at Valmy, which is almost the same thing that happens in 1920 when in the Russo-Polish Russo -Polish War, you know, when the Poles are not satisfied with the territory they're going to get when, they, when, they have a, when a Poland is resurrected here at Versailles, and they invade Ukraine. And it's Trotsky's going to rally the Red Army and stop them at Kiev, and then push them back. You see, this, you saw this happen in France. The revolution was saved. The revolution was saved because someone outside the country decided to take from us or kill our revolution. Now, now fascinating, another historical parallel here. There were some in the Red Army, you know, who thought as we pushed the Poles back, as we pushed the Poles back, once the Red Army gets in the pond, many of the Polish people are going are to greet our Red Army as liberators. The working class. We can spread the revolution in the pond. You know who you know who didn't think that was gonna happen? Stalin. Poland's coming back as a country. There's ardent nationalism going on here. There's historical reasons why they are not gonna not gonna like Russian soldiers coming into Poland. 
Robespierre is going to think the same thing. You know, Jean Pierre, Jacques Pierre Brousseau with you know the Girondins here. Let's spread the revolution. We'll spread, we'll take out these monarchs and spread our revolution across you know across Europe. And Robespierre is thinking of the same thing that Stalin will later think. That's not going to work. They're not going to want us there. That means we'll be stuck in these long wars. Let's consolidate, you know, again, like Stalin, let's consolidate the revolution at home first before we're concerned about what's going on outside our borders. That's what Robespierre was concerned with. Interesting here how you get these historical parallels, huh? Fascinating here. Absolutely fascinating. Or we can even add Ernst Rum. Stabchev, the Sturmabteilung, the St Hitler stormtroopers. He writes this pamphlet. Pamphlet pamphleteering was popular. You know, the, the end of the 18th through the 19th into the 20th centuries. You don't see much of that as much anymore. It's a shame. It's a shame. Of course, what's happened to the written word here? And and interesting here, he says, the na he wrote a pamphlet called The National Socialist, The SA and the National Socialist Revolution. I've got this pamphlet. I've got a number of these pamphlets. They're interesting to read. This one's fascinating. We can spread nas the National Socialist Revolution cross borders with the SA. You know, by 1933, he had three million men in the SA. Of course, there are sober-thinking Germans who are thinking, no. Of course, the German army is a dead set against this because of the fact, you know, the, the, the German army, according to the, per Versailles, can only have 100,000 men. And who controls that army? These Prussian general aristocrats. You think they want to have a, a new German army run by a homosexual? That, that's not going to fly. That's sure not going to fly. You know, these things, there are historical parallels here. However, however, even though the war now is going on, the revolution has, in, in France internally, a cauldron. Now you have countries from the outside. And even though France is eventually going to go to war, not only with the Austrians and the Prussians, but the British, Holland, Spain, and they're going to absorb Monaco. I always found that interesting, Monaco. It seems like the French revolutionaries now are now into, into uh, getting involved in amusement parks. But it shows you how some of them feel about spreading the revolution. That's going to come later on. Especially with the rise of Napoleon. That's really what you're going to see here. It's really what you're going to see. However, you also will have, by April 1793, the Jacobins, you know, they are, they are, they are, they are going to out the Girondins here. And they're going to take control of what's going to be the, the Constituent Assembly or Legislative Assembly, and then becomes the National Convention. And interesting here how this National Convention comes about, you know, when, when, they, when they went from the National Assembly to the Constituent or Legislative Assembly, before... Uh, before, it was just certain people, mostly no nobility and bourgeoisie, who were really delegates to the National Assembly. And then the Legislative Assembly. People like Robespierre said, no, let's open it up. Well, why not open it up if you're looking to take power? And so now you're going to see more of the San Colotes, working class, urban poor, and some of the peasantry elected as delegates to the... You think they really know how to run a government? It's irrelevant. The Jacobins can take control. And that's exactly what's going to happen by the National Convention. What kind of government do you think this is going to be? Interesting. It's going to become more violent. The terror. The terror. And interesting here, the Girondins, you know, in January 1793, many of the Girondins were against beheading Louis XVI. The Jacobins were for it. Led by people like Saint Just, Robespierre, Danton will come around. Yeah, okay, I guess we got to get rid of them. Well, of course you have to get rid of them. 
because he was one of the major reasons why the opposing monarchs are invading France. They want to put him back on the throne. So you're going to have to get rid of him. You're going to have to get rid of him. And they will. Robespierre will never go watch the ex execution. He remained in his office working. Why well, I have to go there? I got work to do. So on January 21st, 1793, off came his head. The outward sign of monarchy is now gone. His wife will follow Marie Antoinette October. However, you know, the Girondins here, the Girondins here supported the monarch. Now, what's going to happen to them? Many of them are going to go to the guillotine as the Jacobins assert their authority. Now it's to the point here, now it's to the point where, you know, Robespierre is beginning to see shadows here. Now it's gone that far. However, in April 1793, the Committee of Public Safety is formed. This literally becomes a dictatorship by committee. And I find this interesting here, this, this Committee of Public Safety. And I'm just going to read a few of these people. It shows you what happens when you have a lack of a functioning system of representative government, or you didn't have one in the first place, and one regime changes to another. Bertrand Barrier, he's 38 years old. He made... <laughs> He made few surviving enemies, changed with the political tide, and will live to the age of 86. Jean-Nicolas Bélin Vérien, 37 years old, argued that the Catholic Church was the most dangerous enemy of the revolution and had to be destroyed. This is the one, who, this one really sticks out, Lazar Carnot. 40, distinguished mathematician and military engineer, took charge of the French armies, mapped campa campaigns, instructed and disciplined generals. Won universal respect for his ability and integrity. Interesting here what Will Durant says. He alone of the committee is honored throughout France today. Interesting. Jean-Marie Collant de Herbois, 43, formerly an actor. Now you even got an actor in France here going in the position of authority here. He suffered disabilities for, uh, that, that, that the oppressed theoretical, theoretical, theoretical profession before, before the revolution. He never forgave the bourgeoisie, the upper bourgeoisie, for closing doors to him. Or the church by his profession, because he was an actor, excommunicated him. There's somebody with an axe to grind. Georges Cothon, 38, so crippled by meningitis they had to be carried in a chair wherever he went. He was a man of kind of heart and iron will who distinguished himself by his humane admiration of the terror. Interesting some of these people here. They really are. Robespierre did not quite replace Danton as a mastermind or will of the Twelve. But he will really be the, be the anchor here after a while. Louis Antoine St. Just, 26 years old, was the youngest and strangest of the Twelve. Most dogmatic, indomitable, intense, and a practitioner of the terror. He's a fascinating character from the perspective. Rejected all roles, fled to Paris with his mother's silver, and spent it on prostitutes. There's a son to be proud of, huh? Was caught briefly, jailed, studied law, wrote an erotic poem. Celebrated rape, especially of nuns. Extolling the pleasure as a, as a extolling pleasure as a divine right. Wow. 
Interesting, some of these people who form this dictatorship by committee is what it is. But Lazar Carnot is the one. Because he, because, you know, France at one point here is not doing well in the war. On August 23, Lazar Carnot, through the Committee of Public Safety, announces levé en masse. This is one way, one way of assuring the revolution could survive. This is something that everybody can gravitate towards. How many, how many times in history do you see where a leader will use war or military action to overcome internal problems or move attention? Isn't that what Galtieri did in 1982? Uh, in the in the in the in the south South Atlantic here with the Falkland Islands against the British, he had a lousy economy. So how do you divert attention? Let's take back the Malvinas. Let's get you know kick the British off the Falklands. That didn't work either, and eventually Galtieri would be out. You know that that British uh, military unit, the Black Watch. As they were boarding the Queen Elizabeth to, on their way to being sent to the Falklands, they were led by the unit band. And they were playing Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. I love the British. Boy, they, they really, you know. I'm sure Benny Hill must have came up with that idea. Jeez. And this is what he says. Interesting what he says here. Carnot, from now on until such time as its enemies have been driven out of the territory of the Republic, all Frenchmen are permanently requisitioned for service of the armies. The young shall go fight, the married men shall forge weapons and transport food, the women shall make tents and clothes and serve in the hospitals, the old men shall have themselves carried into public places to rouse the courage of the warriors and preach hatred of kings and unity of the nation. All unmarried men from 18 to 25 years of age were to be drafted into battalions. Under banners reading, the French people standing up against the tyrants. Soon Paris was transformed into a throbbing arsenal. Gardens of the Tuileries and Luxembourg were covered with shops producing, among other materials, 650 muskets a day. Unemployment vanished. Privately owned weapons, metal, surplus clothing were requisitioned. Thousands of mills were taken over. Capital as well as labor was conscripted. That's, again, what the South is going to have to do after 1862. A loan of a, get this, a loan of a billion livres was squeezed from the well-to-do. Huh, wow. Pay up or you're going to get that haircut. Contractors were told what to produce. Prices were fixed by the government. Overnight, France became a totalitarian State. What happened to the revolution? What happened to being a republic, democracy, freedom of expression? Oh no, that's gone. That's gone. Copper, iron, salt, peter, potash, soda, sulfur, formerly dependent on part on imports, had now now to be had 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 now to be found in taken from the soil of, of France as a as the France was blockaded. By the way. And by September of 1793, there will be over 730,000 men in the French army. Conscripted. Levé en masse. This begins something that will, that will exist well beyond the end of Napoleon. You will see this in the American Civil War. You will see this during World War I. You will see this in World War II. They are industrialized, corporatized, commercialized wars. In this country alone, in 1917, the War Industries Board, led by, chaired by, Bernard Baruch. What happened to free market here? 
can't have it. You're in an industrialized war. He organizes the American economy for war. You have a factory that makes widgets. Well, you know, if you owned your own company, don't you control how many widgets you're going to produce? Depending on your amount of customers you have? Not anymore. We need so many widgets from you. We need them such and such a date. They'll be picked up by the transportation companies, which are now overseen by Washington, D.C. They will be taken to the docks and shipped overseas to France on, by, by, by the American shipping companies, now overseen by Washington. What happened to free market here? It doesn't exist. One man runs the entire economy here. And then to add to this, in, in 1940, the DPC, the Roosevelt administration, the Defense Plant Corporation, which is an interesting innovation, it's a taxpayer-sponsored corporation. You're a stockholder through your taxes. And they will build millions of square feet of factory space so that big corporations can lease it to increase production. Because some of these corporations can't build all these extra factories for the war. Taxpayer can, though. This is where this is going to go. This is where this is going to go. However, at the same time, even though the soldiers are fighting at the front, you still have the struggle for power at home. The Girondins are out, and the Jacobins really run this. It's actually a dictatorship by the Jacobins. Yet, they're fast running out of gas here, too. There are many, by early 1794, who are finding Robespierre a little tedious. And so, in the spring of seven, spring summer 1794, there's supposed to be a festival of the festival of the, what the Savior or the festival of the Savior, I think it's called. <laughs> and Robespierre, being a deist, uh, you know. He's considered, by the way, at this point, a dictator. And that notion is spreading. In fact, there's a Catherine Theo, I think her name is, who, is, who was a re, re, uh, considered a religious clairvoyant, a re, religious, religious speaker, although some people think She's a brick or two shy of a full load upstairs, and they disregard her anyway. And she considers Robespierre the savior. Savior, dictator. And in July of 1794, when you know, the National, National Convention is in session, um, Robespierre will be shouted down. You know, Danton, Danton had gone to the guillotine. And he stated that Robespierre will follow me in the not too distant future. In that he was correct. He was a he was an opponent of, of Robespierre. And Robespierre, you know, they're going to have him arrested and guillotined. And he, the Danton went to went to the guillotine. Uh, I give him credit for one thing. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't grovel. He didn't cry and whatever else. Carry on. He just said, as he's walking to have his head cut off, he says, "I want the public to have a good long look because my head is something to look at." Exercise and bravado here. And then he'll be guillotined. But Napoleon, I mean, uh, Robespierre, Robespierre is shouted down and he goes back in his seat and sits down. It's the beginning of the end. He will be arrested and put in Luxembourg prison. And from there, he will be released and go to the Hotel de Ville. And he surrounds himself with many of his followers. But it's, this is like July 26th. But it's not to be because the National Guard will break in and they'll haul him off to prison. In the course of hauling him off, he will be shot in the jaw. It's kind of hazy here. Uh, there are some historians that thought he could try to commit suicide, which obviously fails. And he's brought before the Committee of Public Safety with his jaw all bandaged up and they condemn him to the guillotine. And 
and you know somebody's going to rip his bandage off. And that must have hurt because he screamed. And then he will walk up to the guillotine and be axed on July 28, 1794. That's really considered here the end of the Great Terror, although there will be more killings in 1795 and 1796. But the Great Terror is considered September 1793 to July 28, 1794. However, there were uses of the guillotine uh, before that, beginning in 1792. It's estimated that in Paris, some 1,800 people, 1,800 people were guillotined. In fact, at one point in the summer of 1793, 50 to 60 people were being guillotined every day. You know, it's a it's wide open season here, um, getting rid of political opponents. It's estimated too that upwards of all through France, upwards of 18 or 20,000, depending on what source you read, had been guillotined through the Great Terror. It was not just in Paris, it was in other cities as well. This is one of the reasons your founders, and they think this reinforced their notions, they didn't believe in democracy, which is why they wanted us as what they call a republic. Which is another reason why when I do that series in February on roadblocks to republic, I've included Shea's rebellion as a talk. Because there were some of your, and this, and this is just prior to the Constitutional Convention, they didn't think that they didn't think, after consulting history, that democracy would last. Which is why they wanted a system, a republic, or a democratic republic, if that's what you want to call it, but one with a, with a network of checks and balances. Read what they write. It's interesting what they write here. It's fascinating. Fascinating. But here you have a country, France, where this revolution is really turning into a dog-eat-dog. Dog. Again, war doesn't help. Because when a country goes to war, does, don't the people become more militant? They have to be, if you're protecting your country, right? But at the same time, you're, you're dealing with a country here that doesn't have a functioning system of government. That's, that's horrible. And this will pave the way, and when I come back, I'm going to get into that. This will pave the way for Napoleon, the Napoleonic dictatorship. The Napoleonic dictatorship, who, who right now is on the rise. Another person here, too, who is going to be on the rise here is Joseph Fouché. Joseph Fouché was Robespierre's brother-in-law. He will later become the secret police chief for Napoleon. He's very much a chameleon here. Knows how to dodge the bullet. <laughs> He's pretty good at it. Maybe that's the kind of man you want as the chief of secret police. He's kind of a forerunner of what you're going to see coming down the pike with people like uh, Felix Zerzhinsky, Heinrich Himmler, and some have even said J. Edgar Hoover. Interesting analogy there, huh? Interesting analogy there. Hoover served eight presidents. Interesting. The power generated by the police chief. Wow. Fascinating here, too, in this study that was done about terror. You know, this, this is, it's fascinating what goes on here. You know, Rousseau, in his social contract, talked about sovereignty of the people. Locke, Montesquieu, that if you want to have a functioning system of government, the dispersal of power has to be. Isn't that what your republic, original republic was? System of checks and balances. 
the legislative branch, the, judici the judiciary, and then what? The legislative branch. Now, interesting here in France, the National Assembly. There's no other house. There's no check on their power. The aristocracy. Once the aristocracy is gone, once the once the monarch is gone, and the aristocracy has been neutered, who controls the national the national convention here in the end? Nobody. And this leads you when you see people like Marat, Danton, and eventually Napoleon. It shows one thing. There is some truth to this, this notion that revolutions eat their own children. Paving the way for later on what's not going to be a functioning system of representative government, but a dictatorship. In this respect, Napoleon later on, who again is rising as a general here in various campaigns leading the French Revolutionary Army. This is not the Napoleonic Army yet, it's the French Revolutionary Army. Fascinating here. Fascinating coming out of the French Revolution and what, it, and what it's forecasting here down the road. Anybody have any questions or, or, or comments or points? Yeah, that's a, that's a nice one. That's a nice one. Uh, there, and that's being remembered right now because this year marks the 230th anniversary of the French Revolution. Just like going back to what we were discussing earlier, uh, World War, the 100th anniversary of World War I is big in Britain and France. Of course, here it doesn't even register on the radar screen. Um, but in France, yeah, there are many people who still remember this. And, um, you know, the French Republic is really coming out of, is really comes out of the ashes here. Known as the French Republic. Of course, you're going to have the First Republic, the Second Republic, the Third Republic. And the Third Republic will die in 1940 when Hitler takes over France. Uh, but this notion of a republic, uh, yeah, you begin to see the shades of representative government coming out of this. Of course, even with the French Revolution, you're going to have a tumultuous 19th century. You know, you're going to see revolutions in Europe, 1820-21, 1830-31, the springtime of nations, 1848. There's revolutions all over the place. As monarchy is dying, capitalism's on the rise, the Industrial Revolution's on the rise, it's almost like they can't get it together, which is another reason why, what, a lot of Irish and Germans are going to come here prior to the American Civil War? Immigration, right? from Europe to the United States. And on top of that, these people can get land, which they really can't get in Europe. And so you see, as we go along here, yes, at, you know, after Napoleon falls, I'll get into this again, but after Napoleon falls, you see here, with the, with the balance of power, the Congress of Vienna, they're going to readmit France into the balance of power here. They have to create a new Europe post-Napoleon, and, 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 and so you'll see the Bourbons put back on the throne, but that's a stopgap because by 1830, you're going to see another revolution, and, and Charles X, the last absolute Bourbon, is out. And Louis Philippe of the House of Orléans is in, and he's a constitution, going to be a constitutional monarchy. Where is France going here? Where is France going? The general trend is to be more democratic, to have more of a form of representative government, because that's in the end what the people are going to want. That's what they're going to want. But it's going to take blood to get there. That's what it's going to take. And in addition to that, again, more people are moving off the land, moving to the cities. That creates what? Now, you know, this is urbanization, but a working class, working poor, Urban poor, now we're going to create other social issues here. Also, you see the rise of what? Unions. That's coming. So this is unleashing a plethora of economic, social, and political concerns here. But it degenerates in the end into a dictatorship, and I'll get into that more when I get back. Um, yeah, you can, you can say that. Um, you know, you know, when, when, when you get to this, what's happening to war here because of the industrial revolution, uh, capitalism, technology, 
And again, you know, as technology advances, what technology, you know, begins to take on a life of its own here. And so instead of people leading, are they being led? That's a question people have to answer here. And so, and, and this, you saw this in the French Revolution, uh, interchangeable gun parts. You know, industrial revolution and technology here. So we have, let's say, a certain cannon here, but we have more than enough parts for it. Well, we have a different caliber, but some of the parts here will go to this gun with a different caliber. Okay, well, let's take the extra parts, and, and now you've increased the amount of artillery you have. That's what you're seeing develop here. And as technology feeds on itself, you're going to see, you know, well, they're still using the musket here. But what happens eventually? Breech-loading weapons. You fire, you throw the breech, it kicks out the shell, you put another one in, close the, close the breech, bang. You're, 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 you've, you've increased your rate of firepower until somebody comes out with something like a Gatling gun here. Now you got the machine gun. And that's what, but, 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 but then again, as this, as this evolves, what's happening to the casualty rate? So you need what? More bodies? Levé en masse. You need that. You're not only going to conscript your entire uh, economy for war, but the population, because one feeds on the other, and that's what this is going to unleash. Levé en masse, organizing entire populations and entire economies for war, and this from a country that was still 92 percent agrarian. Lenin's going to do the same thing, only he's going to, you know, he's going to call it war communism during the, during the Civil War. Organizing the areas they have control of, you know, peasants are going to be in the army, and what industry we have, we organize it for war. It's going to devastate the economy, though, that Russian Civil War, just like this is going to be devastated here. Yes. The bourgeoisie is actually going to come out ahead in the long run. Because who's going to be the bankers? Who's going to be the industrialists? Who's going to, you know, the nobility doesn't do this. They do. And so this is eventually going to lead to somebody like, beg your pardon? Bankers come out of this right. They control the money. And so this will, this will resonate with somebody like Karl Marx, who's going to be a big studier of the French Revolution like some of the Bolsheviks were. That's where you're going with this. That's where you're going in the long run. Yes. Yeah, by, by Louis the Sixteenth, this this country was an economic basket case. And you're getting to that point, and this is a classic example here where the rich just don't want to pay anymore. That's part of this. Somebody just said it sounds familiar. It should. And so, you know, it, Many of the nobility felt that they were such a privileged set, let the mass pay for it. Let the mass pay. But what didn't help their economy, like it hurt the British economy, was not only the Seven Years' War with the British, but France spent a lot of money helping us beat the British. And they had to borrow for this. Well, the banks want to be paid back, don't they? You're a banker, isn't that what you're in business for? You lend money, you want to be paid back. And so by 1786, 1789, some of the nobility are living on credit. What kind of a nobility is that? On credit. Not so much the bourgeoisie, because they're earning their wealth, going back to what you said about bankers. How about the small businessman? Is he going to be impacted, though, by, a, by an adverse economy? Of course he is. But a lot of what he made he made on his own with his business. That's this is going to be this is going to be a major a major reason why they're going to want to take out the aristocracy, nobility, the monarch. They lend weights, the rankers on the economy. You know, the, the there will be a a, uh, a a decline in wine production. And wine was a big export for France, and so that's going to hurt the economy too. Um, rise in prices uh, for grain, bread, so on and so forth, that doesn't help the poor. That doesn't help them. And so while Louis XVI will begin to capitulate here, it's too late. 
They should, the nobility should have thought of that before. You know, let, let the mass pay. I'm part of the nobility. Why should I pay? Marie Antoinette, same thing. Oh, no, no, the, the, no, no, no. The reason the economy the way it is is, is is not spending by the rich. Give me a break. Give me a break. And so the lesson here is the more you leave to the people to pay the freight, the more they're going to get angry. And it's only a matter of time before they're going to take matters into their own hands and you aren't going to like it. They're not, you're not going to like it. And to be brutally honest, heads are going to have to roll here. Heads are going to have to roll. And that's what you saw here. But then, but then again, how far does this go before it turns into be a free-for-all? But then added to this, the invasion from the other monarchs to put this revolution down. Which is why, and I've always maintained this, you know, you look at the success of our revolution as opposed to the French. You know, we're 3,000 miles from Europe. We're contending with one monarch. How many monarchs are the French contending with here? Because they are in the belly of the beast. We weren't. They're on ground zero. They're on ground zero here. And so the violent riposte here is, is just, it's astounding here. The violence that goes on here. But then again, does that impact the ability of a functioning system of representative government to survive here? Yeah, it sure will. So it's going to take more years of development before it's really going to find a home here in France. The seeds, the seeds can be pretty toxic here unlike what you saw here. But again, we're contending with one monarch. They're contending with a number of them. And again, they're in the belly of the beast. Those monarchs in those other countries do not want these ideas getting out. Because they understand what's going to happen here. They understand this quite well, which is why after Napoleon is defeated, they're going to arrange a new balance of power in Europe. But it's too late. Those horses are already out the barn, kind of late to close the doors. You know, the long-term progression here. And then to add to that, that's why you, if you read Mussolini, Mussolini thought that the ideas of the Age of Reason, Age of Enlightenment, you know, allowing people perhaps to determine their own fate, if you want to look at it this way, to run government, that's why you wound up with 1914, hence the fascist agenda. Large corporations, large financial institutions run the economy, and the people are here. The worker is here. That's the essence of the corporate fascist state. Organiza that's a draconian use of capitalism, which is what that is. Which is what that is. You know, this gets back to something that Alexander Hamilton stated. All societies eventually divide themselves into two classes. First are the rich and the well-born, and then the mass. The mass is too unpredictable and too tempestuous to run a country. Leave, therefore, for, to the first class a permanent stake and rule as they will forever steady the mass. How's that working out now? Huh. That was Alexander Hamilton. As opposed to somebody like a Jefferson who, who will call who will, you know, he thought the agrarian is the salt of the earth and, and this idea of that the ditch, that the person digging in the soil is the best protector of Republican, limited, elective government. And he called people like, well, people like factory owners and the bourgeoisie tinseled aristocrats. Interesting when you read your founders how they use the language. That is, it's, it's beautiful to read. Unlike some of what you're getting now. Yes. Jacobins had their had their own media. The Girondists did. So yeah, you know the Louis the Sixteenth newspaper, sure, newspapers. And on top of that, you know all through France here, you know 1789 through 1792, 93, you had various what they call clubs. They're political parties. They're all over the place. They're sprouting here. And so there's really not just a few parties. To be honest here. There were a plethora of them, a multitude of them. Many of them are going to die out or be absorbed or just be purged. 
but you saw a lot of different people with these different ideas. Let's start a club to party. That's what that is. They call them clubs. Let's call them clubs. They rise, they fall. They rise, they fall. They rise, they fall. This is going on all over France. Because there's no centralized control here to speak of. Until really, you know, a, a centralized control that lasts, the Napoleonic dictatorship is really where this goes. And when we come back, I'll get into the directory, what that was. But then again, they lose control, and that leads to Napoleon. So, fascinating here. Truly is where this goes. And how it's going to impact the, 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 the development of government down the road here. Especially in Europe. Especially in Europe. So, But thank God that violence of the French Revolution, that really didn't set up shop here. Because God knows what kind of country you would have wound up with. So you're, you're in a way, you're blessed the way this country turned out. I always remember, I think it was George III, when he was told after the American Revolution that, you know, George Washington wanted to go home. You know, you know when people win a revolution, don't you have the strong man that likes to grab the power and then, right, exactly. And George III didn't believe this. He said if he does that, he'll be the greatest human being in history. You know, and so, you know, you don't, in George Washington, you don't have a Julius Caesar, you don't have an Oliver Cromwell, and you don't have a Napoleon. He didn't even want to be president. Okay, I'll hang around. And at the end of the first term, he wants to go home. No, 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 you got to stick around for another term. Then after the second, I'm going home. Heck with this. I need a break. He did. He did. I mean, okay, he's a landowner. He had slaves. I'll give you that. But, you know, everybody carries baggage. I don't care. I'm not, the, not minimizing that. That's not the point. The point is there, is there is no God on earth here. Everybody carries baggage. It's just a matter of whether it's an overnight bag or a steamer trunk. They all have baggage. But you have to admit one thing. Um, there, there is a lot of positive aspects here to George Washington. He's worth a talk himself. I mean, the, the, I don't know how many have ever read his farewell address in 1796. Wow. It's one of the best. Warning about an overbloated military. Was not a fan of political parties. He thought political parties breeds factionalism. And he thought, and he said, and you're going to find that today. That all parties breed people who will be more aligned with the party than the nation. You don't think you don't have that now? Huh. That was George Washington. Yeah, there is. But George, I've, you know, I've got a book home on George Washington's writings, a lot of his letters that he was writing. He had a pretty good command of the English language. He really did. Um, but again, he. Jefferson, Hamilton, Madison, uh, Noah Webster, uh, people like George Mason. I mean, the way the way they were debating in print the constitution, the constitutional convention. I mean, they, these these guys. Well, Noah Webster wasn't in the constitutional convention, but he was teaching in Philadelphia at the time, and he joined in the after hours debate going on here, writing. Uh, how, how they phrase, how they use the English language to phrase their ideas. I mean, it's a sight to behold. It really is. And I like to pick, I have a two volume set, and each set's about this thick. And, you know, all these participants, what they're writing, it's fast. It's like, it's like a literary soap opera here. It truly is. But they're debating these ideas. And so when you go back to our, 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 our constitutional convention, you know, let, let's, let's have a legislative branch, one house. No, we can't do that. We have to have a second house to offset the first house. A Senate and then a House of Representatives. Can't have just one house because the thinking here is by some of your founders that if, that if you have one house in the legislative branch and you have a strong-willed individual dominating that house, what happened to the chief executive? Now what do you got? 
two competing chief executives here? No, we need a second house to counter the first house. Interesting what they're thinking here. It's fascinating. It truly is. It truly is. Wow. What a group. Like I said, did they have their drawbacks? Yeah, of course they did. But, you know, you can't, you can't really, you can criticize some of what they did, but look, and, but look at it in total and see what they came up with at the time. Wow. And then I always remember what Jefferson said. Did he carry baggage? Of course he did. But he wrote in 1816, and I think he's admitting your founders made a mistake. That it should be, and he said it should be in the Constitution, that every 19, 20 years, or each generation, the country should have a constitutional convention to update the documents to the present generation. Not being stupid, he knew the country in 1787 is not going to be the same country in 1857. Because as he, as he also writes, the present belongs to the living and not the dead. Yeah, it is true, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. So this whole era, you know, people like Robespierre, Danton, but then Madison, Jefferson, uh, what, what, what a time here. What a time. And some of these Frenchmen were no slouches with writing either. But then again, weren't many of them schooled in the classics and Greek and Latin, well-rounded in music, so on and so forth? Yeah, of course. That was how you were educated then. Some of these people are in college by the time they're 14. Of course, times are different. I'll give you that. Wow. And don't ever try to debate one of these people because they'll rip you another navel verbally. They would. They were excellent. They were excellent conversationalists and debaters. I can imagine if one or I can imagine if Jefferson and, Ma and Hamilton were allowed to take the stage with all those Democrats. No, we won't even go there. But I mean, you know, I mean, so, some of these, uh, they, uh, their ability to debate and exchange views. Fascinating. Well, somebody like a Gore Vidal and a, and a William F. Buckley could have held their own, though. Yeah. Oh, another one. Yeah, another one, yeah. Uh, yeah, the sage, I guess you want to use that term, the old man at the time by the Constitutional Convention. Um, I remember he wrote, yeah. Well, Franklin is the one, I think, in 1757, he said in 100 years there's going to be more Englishmen on this side of the pond than on the other side. <laughs> in 1757, he says that. And he's the one who, when he was in France, he saw the Montgolfier brothers fly their balloon in 1783-84. He said, he's prophesizing here already. He says, imagine, I'm not using the exact language, but he said, imagine what it would be like if you had 5,000 balloons and two men in each and you crossed the channel. He's already prophesizing airborne warfare in the 20th century. <laughs> wow. Immediately, he sees this immediately. Immediately, he sees this. And what's going to happen in World War II? Paratroopers. So, fascinating. Fascinating. What a group of people. What a group. Anyway, anybody else have any questions or, or, or comments to make? Keep in mind, we will, now, now I'm not, we're not going to be here next Monday. However, not until Tuesday the 26th. Same time, 3 o'clock. Uh, last week when they were doing some work here, kind of threw the schedule off. And I can't come here next Monday because i got to talk next Monday afternoon up in Goshen. So, Goshen Library, that's a nice place to go. It's a little, not, not elaborate like this, but a little town of about 2,700 people. And I can still get 25, 30 people to show up in that town. And I remember a couple of years ago, you know, there's, it's very picturesque country, if so on and so forth, although they still have the Goshen Fair every Labor Day weekend. And I remember I was, when I went up there two years, I go there every year. And they got me going up there one Monday, one Monday every month for eight months. And well, two years ago when I was up there, I said, hey, gee, it's nice to be back at Goshen. What's new? Oh, well, we got a gas station. They hadn't had a gas station in 40 years. 
got a gas station. I said, that's great. You got a gas station. Wilton's still dry, a dry town. Uh, I'm, doing, um, I'm doing fascism yesterday, today. I already did that one here, I think. Um, but I'm doing that up there. So interesting how, how they, you know, they, they have the great decisions up there, the great decisions group. And the librarian asks me to send three or four different series to do. And so I send them, and they have the great decisions people pick which one it's going to be. Uh, however way you want to pick them is fine. But, uh, yeah, uh, they, they have the great uh, Different libraries do things differently, you know. So, although that's more of a uh, intimate atmosphere there. Uh, not as many people there. So, interesting. It's interesting talking around the state, the different reactions you get from different towns here. 26th will be the end of the revolution, the rise of the Napoleonic dictatorship. Yeah. Yeah, the culmination of this, this mess. Otherwise, that's it. Have yourselves a good evening. Thank you.